Thanks very much, Jim. It's great to be here. Good evening. Uh, I should also say that I have a courtesy appointment in computer science just to complete the, quick, the clean sweep throughout the department, and, and uh, it's, I value that appointment. So these, are, I'm not going to use any slides. I apologize. Uh, these are two pill bottles, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a physician, I should also mention. So uh, in my free time, I'm a, a, an internist, a board-certified internal medicine. I practice a little bit, and then I do a lot of research. But I do prescribe drugs. And the thing about drugs that you may know is that they're perturbations of your physiology to, with an intended effect that's hopefully more good than bad. The, the problem is that they are generally approved by the FDA based on a single drug and its ability to be both safe and efficacious. And very rarely, when the FDA approves drug A, does it consider all the drug Bs that you might also be taking. But when we look at the population, especially the aging population, we have the, the average 70-year-old is on seven medications and has three or four or five chronic diseases that are being treated. And we tend to make five or six independent prescribing decisions uh, trying to optimize for each of them locally, but with no sense of a global optimization of the treatment of the patients. And so we're worried in our work about what all of these drugs working together might do both good, which means it may be that two drugs together get better uh, outcomes than either one alone in the setting of multiple diseases, or worrisomely, we might be giving two drugs that actually individually each one is meritorious, but together they cause problems. And so I just want to tell you a story today about, I'm not, I don't want to hold these both, so I'll just hold the big one. Uh, I want to tell you a story today about a, 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 a series of things that happened in our, in our lab uh, in the context of big data that helped us make one discovery that might have some public health implications. So it all starts with the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, which to their great credit, collects reports of adverse drug events that occur nationwide. These reports can be provided by physicians, pharmacists, drug companies, and the FDA takes them and almost immediately puts them on a website where you and me can download them uh, immediately. For, and they've been doing this for years, so there are millions of such reports. That's our first source of big data, the, the FDA adverse event reports. And what do they look like? Pretty simple. They don't have any names or identifying information because that wouldn't be right to put on the web. Uh, although Yuri can probably infer who all the people are. He'll tell you about that later. Uh, what they have is the list of medications that the patient was on, the list of diseases that they have, and the list of side effects that they experienced. Pretty complicated because they don't tell you, we think this drug was causing this side effect or this disease was causing this side effect. You just get those three lists, the drugs, well, the diseases, the drugs, the side effects. But this is a great data set, and I have a biomedical informatics student uh, in the biomedical informatics PhD program who was in my lab. He said, Russ, we've got to mine this. We have to look for uh, the ability to pull out new information. I said, yep, that's what the lab does. Let's do that. So he built a classifier. That is to say, he looked at the data for drugs that were known to change glucose. There's a bunch of drugs we use for diabetes that lower glucose. There are other drugs that we use, but they happen to raise glucose. He looked at all those drugs, and he built a classifier. And I'm not going to go into the technical details. There's not enough time. But this is all published, and we can get the papers for everybody. But he built a classifier that would look at, that looked at patients, based on all this data, he looked at patients who were on these glucose altering drugs, and he looked at the side effects that they experienced. And he said, can I find a pattern of side effects that's associated with drugs that alter glucose? And he built such a classifier. And he validated it, because he knows a lot of, uh, he had a lot of training examples, so to speak, of known glucose modifying drugs. And he ran it, and he came into my office and said, Russ, I can predict drugs that change glucose with 94% accuracy. And I said, Nick, that's great, but nobody cares, because every doctor knows the drugs that change glucose, because that's what we learn in medical school. So good job. But, you know, nobody cares. Uh, he said, I thought, but he's a smart guy. He said, Russ, uh, I thought you would say that. He said, but I also ran the algorithm on people who were on two drugs, neither one of which has a glucose changing signal alone, but together, together, they changed the glucose. I said, well, that's interesting because especially if neither one of them alone, then that's almost by definition a synergistic effect. And so he showed me the list of uh, two, and he had a pretty 
pretty long list, 20 or so pairs of drugs that had a pretty strong signal together, no signal separately. And on that list, this is where being a doctor was handy, I saw an antidepressant that I've subsequently learned is taken by about 16 million Americans. It's called Paxil or Paroxetine. And a cholesterol drug called Pravacol or Pravastatin that uh, is also used actually by about 20 million Americans. And I said, well, those two, if that's true, if they're changing glucose, uh, and, and, and his prediction was actually that they would increase glucose. I said, if that's true, that's a big deal. But nobody would believe you based on this data mining mumbo jumbo in the FDA database. So he said, OK, what are we going to do? I said, well, we have the Stanford Electronic Medical Record. And that's been de-identified. So the patient names and addresses and all that has been taken away for the purposes of research. I said, let's go into the Stanford Electronic Medical Records and let's see if patients on those two drugs have glucose, evidence of glucose changes. So this is now going to be our second big data source, electronic medical records. I mean, it's really big if you go nationwide. But even at Stanford, this is covering three, six million, three to six million patients. Now, we needed patients who not were only on these drugs, but we needed a patient who was on one of the drugs and had a glucose measurement, then got the second drug and had another glucose measurement all within a reasonable period of time. So there were 11 patients in the entire Stanford medical record. So there were a lot of patients taking both drugs, but only 11 who had one drug, a glucose measurement, the second drug, and another glucose measurement. All 11 of them had their glucose going up. And even within a sample of N of 11, it was statistically significant. So he was very excited. Now he was getting my attention. And I said, Nick, this is awesome. But still, you did FDA mumbo jumbo. And then you had 11 patients. And that's just not enough to get the FDA to like give a warning. So what did we do? We needed more electronic medical records. We called friends at Vanderbilt, which has a big electronic medical record and an informatics research effort, and Harvard. Harvard Partners, and we explained what we were interested in, and to miraculously, they agreed to run the same queries locally in their data. Vanderbilt had about 30 patients. Uh, Harvard had about 100 patients, so we got to about 140 patients, and what we noticed was that this is for non-diabetic patients. Their glucoses were going up on average and statistically very significantly, 20 milligrams per deciliter. So to give you some context, you're walking around, if you're not diabetic, you're walking around with a glucose of 80 to 90. Uh, a glucose of 125 or above um, is signs that you might have glucose intolerance or type 2 diabetes. So a 20 milligram per deciliter bump is getting you from the normal range right on the border and potentially over the border into diabetes. So that was significant. So this was now getting to be very interesting because we now had 150 patients uh, across three electronic, uh, electronic medical records across the country, all with a high glucose. So now we said, this now looks convincing. Let's write this up. And we wrote it up. Uh, but just to make sure, this is little data now, we fed the drugs to mice. Uh, so we submitted the paper because we believe in informatics, but we also know that there are reviewers out there who are very strict. And so we fed it to mice while the paper was being reviewed. And it was very nice because they accepted the paper just on the informatics data evidence. But the sugars in the mice went up. And so in a note added in proof, we said, and by the way, when you give these, drug, these two drugs to mice, uh, their, their glucoses go up. So that was very satisfying, and two data sources. But, and we were very excited, and it's got a, it got a fair amount of press, because it was a nice example of doing our data mining to make a discovery, electronic medical records to do a confirmation. But we were talking one day, and we said, you know, I wonder if patients are sensing, patients on these two drugs are sensing the symptoms of hyperglycemia and doing Google searches. So we wrote a proposal to Google saying, could we please have your search logs? And they couldn't have. There's probably Google people out here. They couldn't have said no any faster. <laughs> so I was sitting around with a friend of mine who works at Microsoft Research, and I was saying, you know, we have this great finding, and I would love to do. He said, well, we have the search logs of Bing. <laughs> and so, you know, I said, well, no offense, but. But it turns out that if you use Internet Explorer, many people who used Internet Explorer have said OK to a pass-through that allows Microsoft to save the searches not only on Bing, but on Yahoo and Google and AltaVista or whatever. So they actually had quite a lot of, and, and he assured me and his lawyers assured me this was all legitimately collected. He had search logs with the IP address of the search over time. 
So we said, okay, let's do the following. Let's, we, first of all, we said people are not going to just search for hyperglycemia, but we found, we defined 50 words that are related to hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia itself, high glucose. But there's other symptoms that go with uh, hyperglycemia, like lethargy, fatigue. Came up with a list of 50 words. What we did is we looked in the search logs for searches where the person searched for one of the drugs and any of those 50 words, or another one, the other drug, and any of those 50 words, and compared those rates of search with the people who typed in both of the drugs and any of those 50 words. And somewhat to our surprise, there was a tenfold greater frequency of searching for the two drugs together and diabetes or hyperglycemia-related words than either drug alone. So that led to another paper where it was called, you know, the wisdom of the crowd, something about the crowd. The crowd, basically, patients are telling us what the side effects of their drugs are because what would we all do? You take a new drug, you have a funny side effect, especially if it doesn't go away, you go to Google or Bing, you do a search. <laughs> And, you, and those searches tell us what, and the number of those searches is great enough that we can infer what's going on. And so the point of this paper is, and by the way, all of these searches were done before we published the paper about the side effect because we were worried that the press associated with the report of the pravastatin and paroxetine causing hyperglycemia might lead people to get worried and to go do a search for other reasons. But we had search logs from the period before we had ever published it, so this was kind of well controlled. And that was exciting, and it was our third data source, and this was the crowd. Very exciting, uh, because now we've talked to the FDA, who to their credit has an office of social media. And they're interested now in looking at search logs in collaboration with Microsoft, because Microsoft is willing to share. Uh, <laughs> They are also um, working with a group that is not our group that is looking at Twitter feeds, believe it or not, and, and we might hear a little bit more about, more about this, people tweet their drugs that they're on and the responses that they're having. <laughs> I, I do not know if that was a design feature of the Twitter product, but they do it, and I didn't believe it until I saw tens of thousands of tweets that these guys uh, at Harvard had collected saying, that, and they can do sentiment analysis where they say, this drug is occurring and the words we're seeing in the tweet are showing dissatisfaction versus, and, the, and in other cases, they have words that are showing satisfaction. And so the FDA is now seriously considering, we've had already a meeting in September, about can we, as they roll out new drugs to the public, can we now do a surveillance for not only single side effects, but for interactions such as the one we discovered based on these social media. Um, so that's all where we are now. It's very exciting. That's the story that I wanted to tell. Um, the, the, it, with respect to the paroxetine and the, and the, pravastat, the pravastatin, the antidepressant and the cholesterol medication, we are working with the FDA to see if they can replicate our signals. First, we have to tell them about our methods because they, these methods are not the methods they typically use. In fact, the first line of our paper said, standard FDA methods will not find this. They read the paper, they called me up, they said, Dr. Altman, our methods won't find this, we can't replicate your finding. And I said, did you read my paper? <laughs> the first line was, you won't be able to see this. But, it, but it's a problem for them because they have a serious duty to the nation to use validated methods that have been proven and they can't just take some wacky Stanford professor's algorithm, which although I believe in it, it hasn't been validated broadly in the community. So they're in this tight position right now, uh, but they're rapidly trying to reevaluate their stable of algorithms and include these kind of newer data mining and uh, uh, big data mining algorithms so that they can use that in their surveillance. So that's the story that I wanted to tell. Uh, the work continues and it's I think an example of where, uh, oh the final point I want to make is all of this data in your electronic medical record, in your searches, is it possible to misuse it and, and use it in ways that are nefarious? Absolutely. And, and Mr. Snowden hasn't done any of us any favors with the NSA thing, but I want to stress that these data also have unbelievable power to unlock new biological and medical discoveries. And so it would be a terrible thing to lock down this data in a, with a blunt method that not, doesn't allow us to um, continue to make these discoveries, because I think we've only begun to scratch the surface. And so 
as a side project now, I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that these data can be shared in a responsible way, respecting privacy and confidentiality, but not turning off this spout, which I think is incredibly difficult. So with that slightly preachy point, I'll stop, and I think we'll have questions at the end. So thank you very much.